Now, we've heard a lot in the press, and I think the press has been good because, again, that's put mitochondria into the news. Sometimes the take on some of the things that we hear in the press are a little unusual. Okay, so I found this uh, in, a, in a newspaper. But again, the discussion around mitochondria, the discussion around the opportunities for families with mitochondrial disease, making sure that this is being discussed and, and, and people are asking questions is really, really important. And what Lilly Foundation do is to raise awareness of mitochondrial disease, and that's why we're all here today. So my, my plea to you is if you've got questions, then do ask your questions in all the sessions, and we'll try our very best to try and answer those for you. So what Alison and Liz asked us to do in this first session is just to go through a series of questions uh, and, and explain a little bit about mitochondria, what they do, and again, some of the complexities of, of the genetics that underlie mitochondrial function that are important to understand in, in how when uh, mutations in mitochondrial genes cause a, a clinical phenotype. So what are mitochondria and what do they do? So we find mitochondria uh, within the cell of almost every single cell within our body. So we have mitochondria in our fat cells, in our brain cells, our heart cells, our nerve cells in the brain and central nervous system. The only one that we don't find them in are red blood cells. And what they do, as you can see in this little diagram in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, within the typical cell you have the nucleus in the middle of the cell and the mitochondria are found in the area of the cell called the cytoplasm. And they're there because they have an important function in making energy in the cell. So when we look at mitochondria within the lab, we can see them uh, in different shapes and forms and sizes. The picture on the left shows what we call an electron micrograph, so this is looking at very, very fine detail of a mitochondria within the cell. And you can see it's got this very unusual uh, membranous structure. Um, these are called Christi, and they're an inner and outer membrane. And within the middle of the mitochondria, the space that's taken up is called the matrix. And mitochondria, when you look at them in other ways, like down a microscope in living cells, you can see that they move uh, around and are able to kind of share their genetic material. Unfortunately, on the Mac, uh, the, the video is not working very well, so I can't show you that. So if we think about what they actually do, there are lots and lots of functions of mitochondria. Uh, and we know that within the context of mitochondrial disease, the most important of these is this set of... Uh, enzymes shown here in the middle, which we call oxidative phosphorylation, or some of you may know as mitochondrial complexes. And these are enzymes that are important in making the energy uh, within the, the organelle itself. So mitochondria essentially turn the fuel that we take into our bodies in the forms of foodstuffs, of, of carbohydrates and fat, into a usable energy source for the cell to work be that the muscle cell or the brain cell or the heart cell. So the analogy of a, of a furnace or a power station is a really good one to be using. And the particular part of the mitochondria, whilst you have all of these functions that they do carry out, that takes, uh, where this takes place are these mitochondrial respiratory chain complexes, which are a group of enzymes that sit within the membrane of mitochondria, making this usable energy source which we call ATP, which is what the cell uses uh, to function normally. Now, what happens when mitochondria go wrong? So, I went to the gym this morning, and this is what I kind of felt like after I'd had 30 minutes in the gym here. Uh, Alison was also in the gym. She was a lot fitter than I was. But when our mitochondria are depleted of energy, then obviously uh, we find it difficult to, to have that energy. Uh, to, to move and to function normally. So when the mitochondria are not producing sufficient energy, it's like the batteries run down and it's losing power and it's not able to maintain power. And of course, as I explained at the beginning, all of the cells within our body have mitochondria and if those are not working functionally, then that's going to lead to a range of clinical problems associated with dysfunction of those particular organs of tissues, and that's how the manifestation of mitochondrial disease occurs. 
Now, as you'll hear throughout the afternoon, and Victoria will talk about this a little bit as well, sometimes it's the mitochondria within just one of these organs or tissues that's affected, or sometimes it's in several. And that, of course, explains some of the variability that we see uh, across the different mitochondrial disorders. So clinicians, of which I'm, I'm not one, I'm a, I'm a scientist and I run a laboratory, but I've been working, as I say, in this field for a number of years, there are a number of, of well-described clinical syndromes associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, some of which are given wonderful names and acronyms, uh, and I'm sure some you, you will have heard of, of, of many of these. And we have kind of grouped them into those that predominantly affect children and those that often we see within an adult population, but we know that these cross uh, both the paediatric uh, and the young adult and adult populations, and some of these names uh, will be very, very familiar to you. But the unifying feature of these disorders is that mitochondrial disease is therefore a collective term for many, many different clinical disorders that are united by a failure of mitochondrial function and energy production. So one of the questions we are often asked is, well, how common is mitochondrial disease? Are these rare disorders? And I think if you take each of those individually, then quite often that can be a, a, a yes to that to that question. But if you consider mitochondrial disease as a, as a group and put all of these disorders together, um, and we'll come to talk about the genetics of mitochondrial disease, because some of these will have very different genetic basis. Mitochondrial diseases represent one of the most common forms of genetic uh, neurological disease that, that we're aware of. Now we work and study up in, in the northeast of England and because of uh, the population that, that we've been able to study over many years, we've been able to do some, some calculations as to how common mitochondrial disease is uh, within our clinical population. And it's round about one in four and a half thousand individuals. Uh, we believe uh, this will vary uh, in different countries. But it's, these, are, these are not rare disorders. These are common disorders. And again, that's why it's important that we make this point and, and, and advocate the, the importance of these disorders uh, for, for clinical care. So why is the genetics of mitochondrial disease so complicated? If we look again, another picture of a cell, I'm not sure how well that projects with the lights on, but this is a cell that we would look at uh, in the laboratory under a microscope that's been stained uh, in two different ways to show up two different parts of the cell. So as you can see in the middle of the cell, there's a big blue circle, which is the nucleus of the cell. And within the nucleus, we have the pairs of chromosomes, uh, which contain the genetic material that make up the individuals that we are, all those important features and characteristics. And again, within the cytoplasm of the cell, the, the uh, part of the cell that surrounds the nucleus, we've used another stain to show up those mitochondria in red. And you can see they kind of form a, a, a reticular dynamic network around the nucleus. Now, mitochondria require uh, genetic information both found within the organelle itself but also within the nucleus to function properly. So if I try and explain this uh, a, a little bit uh, deeper, within mitochondria we have um, a source of DNA called mitochondrial DNA which is a very small uh, double-stranded circular genome that only encodes a total of 37 genes, of which 13 of those make structural proteins that are important for function. So the number of proteins found in mitochondria that are contributed by mitochondrial DNA is very, very small. When we contrast that to the 23 pairs of chromosomes that we find in the nucleus that are made up of around about 3 billion base pairs of DNA and over 20,000 genes, making 20,000 proteins, but of those, there's almost 1,300 that are found in mitochondria. So maybe a hundred uh, uh, fold more than the contribution of mitochondrial DNA, but to, for mitochondria to function normally and properly, you need the contribution of both sets, the nuclear genes and the mitochondrial genes for normal mitochondrial function. So there is a, a pool of over 1,300 different genes that are required to be expressed and make those proteins normally for normal mitochondrial function. And so, therefore, the propensity for mitochondrial disease to arise 
because a mutation of one of those genes, as you can see, is really quite significant. So I'm going to focus on mitochondrial DNA first and talk a little bit about that and its expression and its genetics. So as I said, it's a very small DNA molecule. It's only 16,500 bases in size, so it's very easy to work with and sequence and, and determine it, its, its sequence. Uh, it shows a very strict pattern of inheritance, so we only inherit our mitochondrial DNA from our mothers, and that's obviously very, very relevant within the disease setting uh, for uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations. It's present in high copies within cells, uh, and that reflects the amount of energy required for that particular cell type for ATP synthesis and energy production. So tissues like heart and brain and muscle will have many, many more copies of mitochondria than perhaps uh, mitochondria that you find in skin cells, where perhaps they're not as, as relevant. And there's also a phenomenon associated with mutations of mitochondrial DNA, which I'm going to talk about, called heteroplasmy and homoplasmy. But perhaps one of the most important things about mitochondrial mutations is because of this heteroplasmy is that it's very difficult to predict how these are going to be transmitted from uh, mother to child and, and therefore uh, determine the, uh, the, the clinical status of, of the child in the next uh, uh, generation. Now we've known about mitochondrial mutations for almost uh, 30 years now. The first mutations were described back in the late 1980s and there are hundreds of different mutations that affect um, different parts of the genome and they're all associated with sometimes very, very distinct clinical presentations of mitochondrial disease. So there's ex extensive variability associated with different mutations. But as I say, as a piece of DNA, it's very small, so we can work with it in the lab very quickly and determine its sequence relatively straightforwardly. Now I mentioned in that first slide something called homoplasmy and heteroplasmy, which is very important in understanding how mutations in mitochondrial DNA give rise to a, a, a clinical phenotype. Now within each cell, um, we have many, many copies of mitochondrial DNA, as I, as I mentioned. And if those copies of mitochondrial DNA are the same and identical within each cell type, so I've shown a cell here with lots of red mitochondrial DNA molecules and one here with lots of black mitochondrial DNA molecules, we refer to those cells as being homoplasmic because the mitochondrial DNA is exactly the same in each of those different cells. What we see in the disease setting very, very often is that mitochondria and the mitochondrial DNA are present in two different populations. So we have a wild type or a good mitochondrial DNA molecule and a mutant or a bad mitochondrial DNA molecule. And this is what we refer to as heteroplasmy. So we call these cells here heteroplasmic because they're showing a mixture of the black and the red. Where that becomes important is that the levels of those mitochondrial DNA mutations can vary. And they can vary in different tissues and they can vary between different family members and they can vary enormously as they're inherited from one generation to the next. And with mitochondrial DNA mutations, what we need is a very high level of mutation before we see the manifestation of a clinical problem. So as you can see here in this figure, which is a, a hypothetical family of, of, of a lady here who has 50% um, levels of a mitochondrial DNA mutation, her two unaffected children have levels that are very, very low, but they still have the mutation because it's been transmitted. Whereas only when the mutation exceeds a high level, in this case somewhere between 50% and 65%, does it actually lead to clinical disease and clinical severity. And one of the confounding things about mitochondrial disease that we still really struggle to understand is the tissue specificity associated with many of these disorders, both for mitochondrial DNA mutations and also nuclear mutations as well. Why do certain tissues are affected by some mutations more so than others. So this variability that we see associated with the mutation can happen between different cells within a tissue. It can happen 
between different tissues and as I say it can happen within different individuals within the same maternal family as well and all of these contribute to the the enormous variability that we see. So that's mitochondrial DNA. If we turn our focus back now to the nuclear contribution to mitochondrial function, so as I say the nuclear chromosomes encode some 20,000 genes and 1,300 of those are relevant directly to mitochondrial function, they behave and are transmitted in a very different way. And the two most uh, important modes of transmission are autosomal dominant transmission, where you can find inheritance from father to child or mother to child, and you only require a single uh, copy of an affected gene or recessive inheritance where both parents are carriers of one mutation and there's a 1 in 25, or sorry, a 1 in 4 or a 25% chance of the risk of an affected child that carries both hits, one from the father and one from the mother. So the inheritance of nuclear driven disorders that affect mitochondria are very, very different from those of mitochondrial DNA. What about the variability associated with nuclear mitochondrial mutations? Well, again, there are different genes of these 1300 whose products affect and, uh, and work and function in different tissues. Uh, these give rise to different biochemical defects that lead to this tissue specific expression. Again, the age of onset is, uh, can sometimes be relevant to uh, the pattern of inheritance. So um, autosomal recessive inherited diseases tend to have a much earlier onset, whereas sometimes the dominant disorders uh, will occur much later on in, in adult life. And there are many other things that can affect the way our genes behave and function, including uh, environmental and other genetic influences. So to summarize this first part of, of this talk, mitochondria are vital for cell function. Mitochondrial disease refers to very many different clinical disorders, each of which can have a different inheritance pattern. And whilst individually we sometimes consider these to be rare, it's very important that we understand and recognize that collectively mitochondrial disorders represent a very common group of clinical uh, genetic diseases.